Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, to call on your name, to remember your protection and your provision of us. We thank you for your love for us, Lord, and mostly that you sent your son. I pray that you might help us today as we look at your word, that you would give us what we need, that you would minister to our hearts spiritually, that you would help us to understand more of who you are. So Lord, I thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for being here today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're back in the book of Luke, and we're looking at the baptism of Jesus. Uh, it's, it's only a couple of verses here in the book of Luke, but we're going to take a look at that. Luke 3, says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. I don't know if your baptism was like that. But I can't think of a, I can't think of a better event um, to express our faithfulness towards being obedient to Christ than coming to him in baptism, just in case you're in the wrong place and forgot where you are. Last week, we looked at the ministry of John the baptizer. I, I call him a baptizer because you call him a Baptist and the Lutherans get mad. <laughs> you know, so he's a baptizer. He baptizes people. He's not in a denomination. So, but he's John the baptizer. And he has this particular ministry we saw when he was born and he was filled with the spirit from the womb. There were instructions given to his parents about what he was to do with his life and where he was going to end up. And so we looked at that. And in, in some of the uh, looking forward, we saw what actually ultimately happened with John. He was one of those who was not afraid to tell somebody that they were wrong. He had no problem and uh, speaking about Herodias and all of that. So we, we looked at that and John who, you know, ate bugs and, you know, wore rough clothing. So uh, that was John the baptizer. We, we left off last week with this verse here. And all the people were baptized. It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed the heaven was opened. It's an interesting thing that Luke puts that in here that as he prayed, the heaven was opened because none of the other gospel writers uh, let us know that. So something happened here when Jesus was baptized. Now, you guys know what baptism is. Baptism is us identifying with Jesus. As we go down into the water, it's our death that we're associating with his. And then as we come up, it's his resurrection. So we die to ourselves. We're identifying with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so John had a baptism of repentance. So there were people that were coming and saying, listen, I want to I want to be made new. And this outward cleansing is essentially a picture of what I want to happen on the inside of me. The baptism of Jesus went a little bit differently. And as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death and his burial and resurrection. That just kind of came to my mind. You know how often dads say they're going to be at their kids' things, you know, and then they don't kind of show up. And, you know, I just pictures, oh, look, dad showed up. So. In Matthew 3, verses 13 to 15, we get a little bit more of a picture from Matthew's perspective. And Jesus came to Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Are you coming to me? And that's a, that's a good point because these folks were all coming to be baptized for their sins and Jesus didn't have any. So why would Jesus get baptized if he had nothing to confess and if he had no sin in his life. That's very good. I have a multiple choice question for you. Just, Jesus baptized to fully identify with mankind. That's one of the things he did. He fully identified with us because he was fully man in every way. And he's now identifying with us, giving us an example that we should follow. And number two... It was to enter into ministry. 
this was kind of his inauguration into his official ministry because up to this point, we haven't heard anything about him except that he got lost one day and in Jerusalem and his parents found him and said, what are you doing? Why do you do this to us? And they found him and took him home. He said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And, and then that was that. And Mary just kind of encapsulated that in her heart and they went on. But this is the official entry into his ministry at 30 years old. And f he and fully commit to his death, burial, and ultimate resurrection. See, Jesus did exactly what we do when we get baptized. We're associating with his baptism because we're likening unto the death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus was here committing himself to ministry from here on forward, and he knew where it would lead, and he was committing himself to do it at this point in time. So it's, it's a commemoration, if you will. Verse 22, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, you I am well pleased. I don't know about you, but uh, getting approving words from your father is important, I think, to any young person. And for dad to say, listen, I'm proud of you. And it's interesting, he didn't say, I'm proud of what you're about to do. He says, I'm proud of you now. Right now, I am currently proud of you and what you're doing and what you've been doing. Isn't that interesting? Because we don't hear anything about Jesus's life. And so you wonder, what in the world is he doing that God the Father was proud of? Well, he probably was learning under his dad, had to work with wood and he was a, more of a handyman, not necessarily a carpenter as we might understand being in a union and throwing hammers and that kind of thing, but actually doing handyman work. And they would sometimes work with stone and make things. So it was a bit more than just working with wood. But here's Jesus in his day-to-day -day ministry. And his father says, you're my beloved son and in you I am well pleased. I am now well pleased with what you're doing and, and how you're living your life. And I say that because most of us will not have a large public forum or big ministry like Jesus did or John the Baptist did. But it's in all those little things every single day where we do those things faithfully that God's called us to do. And whatever it is that God's called you to do, that you're honest about it and that you do it truly under the Lord instead of for the approval of other people. Because that's a very disappointing life, isn't it? It is. If I sat here and waited for every one of you to confirm that what I'm saying is truth, I would be very disappointed. <laughs> But Jesus was just going about his business, and I love that. The Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, and somebody would say, well, didn't he have the Holy Spirit before? Hmm. Of course he had the Holy Spirit before. He, everything he did, I'm sure he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a special thing, isn't it? Where the Spirit of God comes down and empowers him to do something. And we see this all throughout the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is actually sent upon people to do and perform particular tasks. And here, it's the inauguration of Jesus's ministry. And I want you to notice that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all present for this event. So if people wonder if you're Trinitarian, you can always point them to this scripture and say, I don't know what you want me to do about this. But the Holy Spirit comes came like a dove. By the way, it wasn't a dove. It wasn't like some bird went, you know, and landed on him. It, it was like a dove. And essentially, it's the equivalent of what happens in Acts chapter 2. If you remember, the Holy Spirit falls upon the church, and over the top of each one of them, what appeared over them was like unto tongues of fire that came upon them. And that was when the Holy Spirit came into the church. That was the inauguration of the church when the Holy Spirit fell. So this is very much what happens, but with the life and ministry of Jesus. And, G and God says, you are my beloved son. You alone are my beloved son. You are my only beloved son. If you look into the text, that's what it means. God from heaven declares Jesus's uniqueness. And he's a begotten son, which is rather interesting. So, 
God gives his approval from heaven, which, uh, man, that's got to be pretty cool. And he says, I am well pleased. I'm already fully satisfied with you and what you do. Does God look down on you and say the same? Just nod yes, because he does. He is pleased with you because of what Jesus did for you. God is pleased with you. doesn't mean that every single thing that you do is perfect, because, you know, I don't know about you, but I tend to get hung up on perfection. Do you know what that is? That's when, like, you try to do everything. Oh, I missed, I missed working out on Monday. I'm a deep, rotten, horrible sinner. You know, I, you guys don't do that. I, I guess I'm the only one who beats myself up. In Mark 6, 3, it says, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? By the way, those are his brothers, his, his half-brothers. And are not his sisters here with us? By the way, Jesus had more than one half-sister. And are they, and they took offense. You see, Jesus all of a sudden comes out of the gate and he's preaching and he's teaching and he knows the word of God like none of the pros do. And they're like, who's this guy? He's nobody. He's a carpenter. He's the carpenter's son even. He was known as the carpenter or the carpenter's son. Either way, depends on when you look. And suddenly he's got this power in his life, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in his life, since this experience, I've known a lot of people who have submitted themselves to be obedient to the Lord in baptism, and after the baptism, they change. I've also seen people go through baptism, and they tend to fall away very quickly. So it's, kind of the, it's kind of the speed bump, if you will, that either rockets you into a fuller relationship with Jesus Christ, or it, it causes you to say, this isn't for me, I'm done. In verse 21, oh, I'm sorry. So this is the life of what Jesus did when he was baptized. And it's interesting because he goes right from here, right out to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And then he actually comes back from through the Jordan and John sees him. And John was talking about all of this stuff. You know, he's got his winnowing fork in his hand and he's going to bring justice and judgment. And, you know, he's preaching up a storm about, you know, I, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. And, you know, he's, he's got all this to say about Jesus. And then when Jesus goes out and he gets tempted in the wilderness and it's this 40 days where he's out there, I think John changes his mind because he, he sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And suddenly, John sees him very differently. Because you see, you see John, before he meets Jesus, is all about this power and authority and, uh, you know, how God's going to come and clean things up. In fact, there's a point at which John gets arrested about one year into his ministry, and then he's in jail for two years. We talked about that last week. And suddenly, he hears that Jesus leaves from where they were. And he's like, what, what's up with that? And he sends some disciples to Jesus say, are you the guy or are we looking for somebody else? Because John's languishing in prison, wondering what, what are you doing here? Yeah, I, th I thought you were, I was supposed to usher you in and you were going to take, take over. I handed you the baton and it's like you, you went off and did your own thing. And Jesus said, well, go tell him what you see. You know, the blind can see, the, the, the lame can walk, the lepers are healed, that the good news is preached to the poor. So he explains all of that, and that's what his ministry was about. It wasn't about following John's footprint. So it's interesting how John tends to change from, from one side of, of baptizing Jesus to the other side of his temptation. In verse 23, now Jesus himself began his mystery, ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. I mean, can you imagine having that kind of a stigma and growing up that way, or Mary being a single parent, because apparently uh, Joseph has died um, somewhere in the interim here, and we're not told exactly when. But growing up like that and being the person who's going to take care of his mom and, and run the family business, if you will, Jesus has this stigma upon him. And we know that he has at least four brothers and at least two sisters. So Jesus has this ministry of just working in the workshop, just making things for people. And that's his first job. And I don't know about you, I don't know what job you have right now, but 
Are you being faithful with what God's called you to do where you are? Because you don't know what the future holds for you either, right? I think about Jesus for 30 years who's working in a carpentry shop and, and the burning desire of his heart is to get out there and to teach and to share the good news about who he is and he's got to keep it a secret and just, just keep working, just keep working, just going about that. But see, ultimately, Jesus becomes the leader of men. He becomes somebody who is uh, the Messiah and announces his ministry and collects, chooses 12, even Judas himself, and he goes about his ministry. So that's ultimate where God has called. I don't know if God has a calling on your life and if he's spoken to your heart about something that has not yet occurred. But it's a very difficult thing to hold on to that word. I remember when I was a young, a young Christian, and I had accepted Christ and I began to get into the word and I began to grow and I got excited and I really felt like the Lord had called me into full-time pastoral ministry. That was when I was 24. I didn't get to be a pastor until I was 50. But all during that time, I learned very, very important things. Not, not that I would get the job, but that I would be able to do the job. You know, because getting a job is one thing. You just have to have a resume full of lies. <laughs> but to do the job yeah you can get a job with a lying resume did you know that did you see all the political people that do uh, anyway graduated from Oxford yeah, what, is, what is that a shoe store you know Jesus had to go through all of that before he finally got to the place where he was going to ultimately do what God called him to do and the Lord may have spoken to your heart about something I can tell you he's not done with you yet you're not in the final place yet, and God will get you there. And this is when I learn to pronounce. So it was thought that he was the son of Joseph, and it says here, Joseph was the son of Heli. Actually, he was the son-in-law of Heli, and we find this out from the Talmud. Heli is actually the father of Mary. So this is the genealogy of Mary, which goes all the way back, and, and we'll just read it here. Um, I don't know why. The son of Heli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jonah, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Shemai, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Jonas, the son of Risha, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, that's short for Adidas, the son of Kasim, the son of Elmodam, the son of Ur, the son of Jo... Jose, I know that one. <laughs> the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonah, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melia, the son of Menon, uh, known for antiperspirant, the son of Matthias, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Na Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, Latino, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Saleh, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, there's a good one for a child, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. I'm sure I will get letters. <laughs> I'm sure you can butcher them better than me, but there you go. That's the end of the service. Thank you for coming today because <laughs> that's the end of chapter three. So why are these things important? Why is lineage important? Well, I don't know about you, but I, I can't trace my lineage back but a couple of generations, and, and then it's just complete fog. I have no idea where I came from. I just know that I'm the compendium of uh, all nations, so I'm like every man. But with Jesus, 
Luke demonstrates his humanity through Mary and goes all the way back to Adam. By the way, women are not normally mentioned in genealogies. It's the son of the son of the son of the son of, as you may have noticed, which is where you get your last name typically. And uh, we've, we still do that today. But Luke demonstrates his humanity going all the way back to Adam, the son of God, or God's son, the one he created. So that's why Luke goes all the way back. If you go to Matthew, Matthew has a different one. He proves the royal line through Joseph, his adopted father, back to David and Abraham. And he doesn't go all the way back to Adam. So de depending on, on which one you read, one is about Mary, one is about Joseph. So legally, because Joseph was his adopted father, if you will, uh, Jesus is also in the line of David as well as with Mary. So it's both. And it's interesting because Matthew mentions Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, along with Mary. And what do they all have in common? There was a sexual something that happened. Tamar was raped. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was a Moabitess. She wasn't even of the tribe of Israel, so there wasn't that, but she, was, she married somebody from Israel. Now, but you're not supposed to marry somebody from there. But a Moabitess, you know who Moab was? It was the offspring of incest. So you got, and, and Bathsheba, which you know. So you've got all of these ladies who Matthew takes pains to mention in the genealogy. That makes me feel like, you know, if somebody said, yeah, I'm royalty and I can date myself all the way back to this royal king or whatever, I'd feel like, oh, mighty king. You know, I couldn't approach him. But here, Jesus, his, his lineage is among common people, among people that are just as flawed as you and me, and maybe more so in some ways. And I think that was deliberate and intentional. They prom the promised Messiah was prophesied to come through the tribe of Judah by David's offspring. And that's hugely important. So to verify that uh, is really important. By 70 AD, most of the records that were kept in the temple were burned because it got leveled in 70 AD by the Romans. And so for people to actually prove their lineage anywhere beyond that is incredibly difficult unless you get it from the scriptures, which is so good that we have them. So that's why lineage is important. I'm going to jump right into chapter four because we still have time. <laughs> chapter four. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, when they had ended, he was hungry. You might say that's a very strange thing. First of all, he fasts, and he's driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. It's like, hey, Dad, I'm going into ministry. Oh, I'm so glad you're my beloved son. I'm well pleased. It's great. And the Holy Spirit says, don't eat anything for 40 days. Go out in the wilderness. <laughs> wow. That's like graduating from high school, and your dad kicks you out when you get home. Right? Could it be that the Holy Spirit would lead you into a trial? That's what the scripture teaches. Now, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit led him into this trial. I think about Jesus. When Jesus took the disciples, and he was with them, and he fed the 5,000, the 5,000 men anyway. There were women and children that weren't even counted. So you've got 5,000 households, if you will. And he feeds 5,000 from the, these, these few small fish and, and the bread that he had from a little boy's lunch they confiscated and feeds them all. And they have 12 baskets full of leftovers. And the people say, this is the guy. This is the Messiah. Let us all march to Jerusalem right now and install him as king. Well, take, take the Romans by force. And Jesus said, ooh, Give me just a minute, guys. And he gathers his disciples and he puts them in a boat and he says, get out of here. And he pushes them across the lake and he's like, I'll catch up. And they go across the lake. He goes back to the people, 
gets his way through and he goes up on a mountain and he prays all night alone. And it says it's about the third watch of the night, which is between 12 and 3. And he's looking and they're only halfway across. They should have been across by now, but the wind was in their face. They couldn't put up a sail because it was directly in their face. So you know what they're doing? They're rowing all night long. And Jesus up on the mountain could see they're only halfway across. So he decides he's going to come down off the mountain and he walks on the water out where they were. The question is, who put them in the boat? Jesus. Jesus. Who put them in a difficult place where they'd have to row all night against the wind and still not get to the other side? Jesus. Jesus did. So any of you think that coming to know Jesus Christ is going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise for you for the rest of your life and everything's fine, you got to read the scriptures a little closer because the Holy Spirit took Jesus and put him in the most difficult situation that I would say you and I having the powers of Jesus wouldn't be able to survive probably. And the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit was driven, actually the book of Mark says he was driven into the wilderness. So the Holy Spirit can lead you into a very difficult place. It's a little bit like buying a new motorcycle, Rocco. <laughs> and you say, man, I got a new motorcycle. Let's go test it out. You see, Jesus is out for a road test. Let's see how the Holy Spirit is working out in his life. And you're going to see, you know, the end of the story, flying colors through all of it. I mean, if you, get a, if you get a brand new Jeep or something, my goodness, don't you want to take it out on like some, you want to take it out, right? And that's what it is with Jesus. It's not, let's, you know, let's see if, if Jesus can fall. He's now going to go 15 rounds with the devil. And we're going to see that he wins victoriously. So, Hebrews 4.15 says that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet without sin. We're going to see this small little episode of Jesus being tempted in three ways, because the devil only has three ways that he uses with us, three categories, that Jesus was able to handle all that. How much more is he a worthy savior for humankind because he did not fall into sin? That's why I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Temptation is when desire meets opportunity. Temptation is when desire meets opportunity. It's not something that is completely outside of you. And it's not something that's completely inside of you. It's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. You know the devil knows exactly where to tempt you? Yes. Because he watches you. The devil can't read your mind, but he knows your track record because he's scoping you out. He did with Job. And God even asked him, did you, you check out my, my servant Job? Did you scope him out? He's pretty righteous, right? And then the devil had all sorts of reasons why he was, and he was wrong. But temptation is when desire meets opportunity. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from temptation means God, please don't let me get into a situation where my weaknesses are going to meet with opportunity. And the part of the way that we keep ourselves from falling into sin is by removing ourselves from the opportunity of sin. Right? If I got a problem with alcohol, I shouldn't be a bartender. Simply, right? If I have a problem with uh, lust and sexual immorality, I shouldn't be a lifeguard. You're going to put yourself in all kinds of temptation. If you have a problem with self-control with food, you probably shouldn't be a chef. There are very few skinny chefs. Have you noticed that? I'm just saying. That's not in the scripture. It's just my opinion. Anyway, James 1, 13 to 15 says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires 
and enticed. It's, a, it's actually a fishing term. They're lured away and excited to follow something that isn't real, and there's a hook in it. When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. That's a reproductive uh, sort of thing that happens when we fall into sin. You wonder, if, if a loving God really were in heaven, why would he let the devil tempt you? Did any of you ask deep questions like that? Like, yes. can God make a rock bigger than he can carry and stuff like that? Well, the thing is, because we can handle it with the Holy Spirit of God, and it just shows that God is who he is. Because when I can handle temptation, when people come up to me and offer me all sorts of stuff, the devil's vanquished because of what Christ has done in my life. And that's why Jesus looks so good in the story, because he wins. Of course he wins. How could he be a winner for us if he wouldn't win for himself? And so there's 40 days of Jesus not eating. I don't know if you know anything about fasting, but fasting is kind of interesting. After the first few days of not eating, your digestive system stops screaming at you. Because the first few days are the hardest. And you can get headaches. If you drink coffee on a regular basis and suddenly whoosh, no coffee, you'll get a caffeine headache. It's like, it's like DTs, like a little bit of DTs. It is. It's bad news. So Jesus is going through all that, and then your body actually feeds on itself, which sounds like cannibalism. kind of is. You feed on yourself. In fact, your body has been known to uh, cure itself of many things during fasting. Your body actually absorbs tumors because your body's got to live on something. So it just starts to eat stuff up as it goes through all of the stores that you have in your system. And so for a long time, you don't even hunger anymore. Your breath gets foul. I'll just let you know. Make sure you brush your teeth regularly. And after that, there's a point at which your body is done absorbing whatever it can absorb, and you're now going into starvation your body suddenly turns back on and you're hungry. And this happens just before you die. <laughs> so Jesus is 40 days in the wilderness, dry, arid. You think humidity's bad. It is. But he's out in the wilderness for 40 days with no food. I, I get cranky, you know, easy. How about you? I remember my mom, she used to say, don't talk to me until I've had my coffee. I was like, okay, mom. I'd wait till she had two or three, you know. Or I'd just stay away. But for 40 days, it's rather interesting because 40 is the number of trial, okay? And you can see this throughout the scriptures as you go. Moses, he was 40 days with no food. It's rather interesting. And he was in the wilderness too, wasn't he? And there it is in, in Exodus 34:28. Elijah had a meal, and he went 40 days off that meal. And so we see that it's a fairly common thing. This 40 is a time of trial. We also see that Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years is a period of trial. Just so that you know, these numbers actually mean something. God has imprinted little winks into all of these things. And so Jesus is out there for 40 days, and he's now getting hungry, that's when the devil comes. When you're weak and when you have desire. Because it's when desire meets opportunity, that's when temptation comes. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, you guys know that sometimes stones can look like bread. There's a stone that looks like sliced bread. These are real places, guys, and it looks like bread. And the devil said, hey, why are you being hungry? You can make bread. You can make this whole desert bread. Why are you suffering? I mean, didn't just your father say you are the son of God and whom I'm well pleased? 
why shouldn't you have something to eat after 40 days? Is that asking too much? I know you guys don't ever have this voice on your shoulder that says you deserve something. Or that if God really loved you, you wouldn't have to be suffering this way. And here's Jesus in the middle of this trial and this temptation that the Holy Spirit drove him to do. And now the devil's compromising. Hey, just uh, take care of your needs. Take care of your physical needs. Why do you have to do what God wants you to do? I think we all go through that. And so what does he do? He responds with the word of God. The word of God. God said, you see, you're telling me one thing, but God says. And you know, you have to know the book good enough that you can fight yourself out of temptation. He didn't try to reason with him. He didn't have a conversation with him. He didn't say, I, I bind you in my name. I, like he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't go singing songs. Oh, the devil hates praise. Ah, oh, he didn't do that. He didn't like all these things that people will tell you that you need to do to get out of temptation. He just said, that's not what God said. That's not what God said. Oh, you, you people, you people in that church, man, it's like you worship the Bible. I don't worship the Bible. I worship the God of the Bible. And his every word is that which is going to endure. And he's lifted up his word above his name. The scripture says. And so... If you're going to know the word of God, if you want to do battle with the devil and you want to come out victorious, do what Jesus did. Know the word of God. Well, you know, marriage isn't just, you know, two people that go in front of a, a pastor at a church and make a commitment. I mean, marriage is what happens in your heart. As long as you love each other, then we can have sex, right? That's not what God said. I'm, uh, I'm just saying. Has the Holy Spirit brought you to a place where you feel like you're in a trial and you could relieve yourself of this trial? I can get out of this. <laughs> Piece of cake. I don't have to be a pastor anymore. I can go get a job and make six figures. Why am I working so hard? These people ain't listening. <laughs> That's not what the Lord said. It is written. It is written. It's hugely important that we know the word of God. Memorize it. Hide it in your heart that you don't sin against the Lord. It's hugely important because it's a chosen weapon. Jesus pulls out the word of God on the devil and he escapes temptation. Defense against the dark arts begins with training in the word. I don't know if any of you know who Harry Potter is, but he has a special teacher who teaches him defense against the dark arts. Well, we have the real thing, Amen. which is the word of God. Right. So temptation of materialism, that stuff will satisfy all your needs, that things are what you need. You know, what you need is, you know, if, if you only had the new iPhone or if you only had a new car or if you only had a new job or if you had a new neighbor or you had a new church or you had a new whatever, if only I had a new pair of shoes, I'd feel much better. If only I had a different job, if only, if only, if only, if only. You see, whatever it is you think that's going to quell your desire, very well could be a temptation. But I don't know about you. I look for a job where I can make the most amount of money for the least amount of work. How about you? Amen. <laughs> but what does God say? It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. It's not about meeting your needs. It's not about how much material you have. It's not the guy with the biggest toys wins. It's none of that. This is the temptation of materialism, to satisfy and to get everything you long for and desire. You know, the most unhappy people in the world are people that get everything they want. Because once you have everything you want, you realize nothing satisfies. You wonder, why is it that these very extremely rich people are committing suicide? Why are these very wealthy people ending it? Because they realize that there is nothing on this earth that will satisfy except for Jesus Christ. He's the one who created that spot, actually, in us that he fills himself. And then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, 
For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Doesn't that sound like a lie? But it's not. If it was a lie, it wouldn't be a temptation. The devil says, you see, this is my place right now. And these people do whatever I want them to do. And all you have to do is just one, just bend one knee. Show me a little honor. Show me a little respect. That's all I want. And I'll give you all of this. You know what it means? Jesus wouldn't have to go to the cross and die for you. He wouldn't have to be miserably tortured to death and die and be separated from his father for your sin. It's a shortcut. The temptation of taking a shortcut. Any of you ever tempted to take a shortcut? Yes. Go, through the, go through the red light. Go up the one-way street. Take a shortcut. Probably none of you. But by the way, the, the light out here on 36th to come into Thompson Avenue does not turn green except every other time before 6 a.m. Can I tell you what I'm thinking? When I'm at 5 o'clock, I'm sitting at the red light that's green for the other side where there is no one and there's no one on the highway, and it's telling me, you stay right there, dude. And I have it timed out. As soon as the other light turns red, I got three seconds before the other light turns green and mine stays red. And I got a zippy little car. I could... It's the temptation of taking a shortcut. Jesus wouldn't have to go to the cross. He wouldn't have to die. He wouldn't have to suffer. And he wouldn't have to teach people that don't want to hear him. He won't have to deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes. And the... He wouldn't have to deal with all of it. And the devil is saying, I'll give you all this glory and all this authority without you having to suffer. That's a temptation, isn't it? Hey, listen, I'll, I'll give you this great and wonderful thing if only you do this small favor for me. I will ask you for a favor one day. That's, that's what it is. In 1 John 5, 19, it says this, that we know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. You know, God created everything the way it should be and it's been brought to the place where it is right now because of sin. Mm -hmm. This is definitely the domain of the devil. And he is doing whatever he can right now to take as many people with him as he can. That's his mission. And it's interesting, he says here, all authority I will give you and their glory for it has been delivered to me. It was, I didn't see the, the FedEx truck. I didn't see the uh, Amazon truck. Who delivered this world into the hands of Satan? We did. God set it up all nice. He put our representatives, Adam and Eve. And he said, here it is. Just this one tree. Don't eat it. The day that you do, you will surely die. Or death will then take hold of you which is what happened. Everything was ours, boys and girls, and we gave it away. When we fall to temptation, we do it all over again. Have you fall to temptation? We failed the first A couple of you, okay. We do it all over again. And our representatives would do exactly what we would. We did. We delivered it to them. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Just bend your knee, Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan. You know, he says this one other time. He says it to Peter's face. Get behind me, Satan, for it is written. He says, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. It's a good thing Jesus knew the scriptures. You know, even Jesus had to learn the scriptures, just like he had to learn to walk, just like he had to learn everything else. He learned the scriptures because he was a full human being like you and me. And he did not exercise his divine prerogative. He never did. 
That's like when somebody slaps you on one cheek and you resign your prerogative to slap them back. It's the same thing Jesus asks us to do. In Isaiah chapter 14, it gives us the whole lowdown about how Lucifer fell. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. It's interesting. He said he's going to sit in a high place. And here he tempts Jesus in a high place. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. It's interesting. He says, I will be lifted up. I will go to a higher place. And, you know, we do a lot of that. Oh, I'm not doing that. Oh, no, I'm going to go do this. And Jesus said, be careful what you say, because you don't even know what tomorrow holds. Well, I'm going to go, we're going to open a business. We'll make a million dollars and we'll roll it over and we'll do. Jesus says, you do not even know what tomorrow's going to bring. When we start getting into that, I will, oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, you won't. You don't know who you're talking to. You got to know what spirit you're of. So this is how the devil fell. And it's because he said, I will. What about it is written? Do you live your life by I will? Or do you live by it is written? That's the choice. This is the temptation of pragmatism pragmatism and doing whatever works. Well, it works, you know. Well, it would be illegal for you to go through that red light. Yeah, but it works. And, you know, nobody's here at five in the morning. It's a temptation of pragmatism, doing what works, right? So it's not materialism, it's pragmatism. Let's, come on, it's really not necessary that we do all this. When Jesus wrote that, he didn't mean what he said. Have you ever had to reason through the scriptures and Try to find a, well, see, Jesus didn't know what I'm going through. I'm a unique situation. Even though no temptation that's overtaken you is, is, is something that's not common to everyone. Be careful of shortcuts. There's no shortcut to glory. And Jesus found it by humiliation, not by glorification here on the earth. And he asked us to join with him. And he says that we should take up our cross and follow him. Each one of us has something that we need to give over to him. And then he brought him to Jerusalem and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written. Now the devil is playing the game with him. Okay. Every time I tempt you, you, you snap back with it is written. Now I'm going to give you a scripture. Jesus, did you ever have the devil tempt you with a scripture? Okay, none of you will admit to it. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see, the other temptations were not trusting God's plan. This is over-trusting. You see, I, you mean I can do anything. Like, I, I'm just going to fall down headfirst into the floor, and I'm going to trust that the God's, God's word says he's going to have the angels fly down. Can you imagine what would happen if that happened to Jesus? If he just did a swan dive off the top, and the angels swooped down last minute and grabbed him before he hit the ground? And do you not know that the temple is always occupied by lots of people, and they would all see this and go, <gasps> He is the Messiah. Another temptation. He's actually quoting Psalm 91. This is what Psalm 91 says in its entirety. By the way, be careful of pulling a scripture out of context because you can torture it to make it say anything you want it to say. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Notice the angels are going to protect you so that you can keep all of his ways. 
Not that you can do whatever you feel like doing. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Psalm 91, fantastic passage if you, if you study it out. Uh, we don't have time here because I just leapt into chapter four. But good passage for you to look up today. He says, yeah, God will take care of you so that you can do everything God wants you to do. So if God's called you to do something, know that the Lord's with you. If you go to do something you feel like doing and it's not a really good idea, you can be sure that you don't have his protection. But this is over trusting God, you know. I, have you ever said, hey, God, if you really want me to do this, give me a sign. You know, nothing big. Lightning, that'd be good. <laughs> Just a, give me a sign. Well, it says that the Jews seek for signs and Greeks seek for wisdom, and yet we find Christ, who is both the wisdom of God. Anyway, you know. And so he says, that's it. You're done. And Jesus answered and said to him, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And that was the end. That was the end of his temptation. These three plays. That was it. This is the temptation of sensationalism. Jesus do a swan dive off this 400 foot precipice. By the way, it was 400 feet high. Josephus tells us that. Uh, it was a historian. The pinnacle of the temple was 400 feet high. So that's like 40 stories. 40 stories. Go for it, Jesus. And the angels will come down, swoop you up, and guess what? You'll get all the glory. Everybody will know you're the Messiah. There's no more having to teach people that don't want to learn. There's no more miracles. And the disciples saying, yeah, what, what the heck are you talking about, Jesus? You know, none of that. Sensationalism. Can you imagine if the church attracted people by spiritual acts, you know, by people getting demons cast out of them or people falling down on the floor and flopping around or, you know, or if I were to start dancing and sweating and, you know, <laughs> you know, there are churches that do all that kind of stuff. There are people that do all that kind of stuff. Or else they talk to y'all nice, say you got your best life now. <laughs> that sounds like the devil. The devil says you should have your best life now. You should have your bread. You should eat it. You should be full and enjoy all the wonder of God. I don't listen to him, but I can tell you he sounds a lot like the devil because the spirit drove him into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. The spirit of God did that and God was with him. And he says, you're my, you're my son and I'm proud of you just the way you are before he ever went into this. And he always shot back it is written, it is written, it is written. Are you tempted? <coughs> Do you know the antidote? It's the scripture. Do you have a scripture to tackle and throw at the, throw at the devil? When he says, well, you could just think about this for a while. You don't need to act on it. Just continue to think about it. It is written. There are things I don't look at. There are things I don't do. There are people I don't spend time with. There are places I don't go. And there are things I just will not do. Because it is written. I was not made for immorality. I was created for the Lord. And it's not my life. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives within me. And now when the devil had ended temptation, yay! Yay! He departed from him until an opportune time. That's a little ominous at the end, isn't it? He departed until he could come back and maybe had another opportunity. And you know he showed up at the cross. You know he showed up there. Or when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration and there were the, the 10 disciples trying to cast a demon out of a boy and they couldn't do it. And he's saying, how long am I going to be with you? Jesus was tempted. 
Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation, Jesus told his disciples in the garden. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen? So we need the word of God in our hearts. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overcome you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful and not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but along with the temptation will also provide a way of escape that you will stand up under it. Do you believe that? There's none of this, the devil made me do it, I couldn't help myself, you don't understand. It is written that there is no temptation that's not common. It's, it's common to everybody. Oh yeah, but you don't know my situation. No, maybe I don't, but I know what the word of God says, and it is written. And God's going to provide a way of escape. So you know what? Keep your eye on the exit sign. That's the way out. How do you get out of this temptation? Sometimes you got to be like Joseph, and even though you're naked, you run. Beware of the temptation to give up what you want most for what you want now. Be careful of the temptation that you give up what you really want for what you want right now. Very often we burn the future for today. And you can have a little bit of pain today and have joy for the rest of your life that you made a right decision. Or you can have happiness today and regret it for the rest of your life. All you have to do is talk to some people in this room. They'll tell you. One bad decision. Look at David. Look how David's life was. This meteoric rise to be king and overcame with Saul. And he was, he was humble. And he was a man after God's own heart. And he did everything right until he succumbed to temptation. And everything went downhill in the kingdom. Everything went downhill with his life. There was plague. There was all sorts of problems in his own family. There was death. It was, it was terrible. Yeah, but what is your life? My life was the other way around. Yeah, there's hope and happiness in that. So if we look toward that, we got it. But I, I praise God because I've said no to myself and to do the things that I want to do. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I withhold a smack from somebody that really deserves it. <laughs> because I don't want to be, I don't want to be a sinner and I don't want to be, you know, anything other than what God wants me to be. And so we should do that. We should do that, right? So be careful. Beware of the temptation to give up what you want most for what you want now. And that's really the thing. We have to have some foresight and be able to look beyond the thing. You can even logistically work this thing out and say, okay, if I were to do this, what are the possibilities? Well, first of all, you're, under the, you're not under the umbrella of God's protection anymore. So anything can happen. If I decide, hey, I'm going to go through that red light on Route 36 to get here, you know, five minutes earlier. What's the possibility somebody's going to hit me? If I'm not under God's protection, there's a good chance anything could happen. So I'll wait right here. It is written. <laughs> Temptation usually comes in through a door that has been deliberately left open. Temptation often comes through a door that was deliberately left open. The scripture teaches us that we should not make any provision for the flesh. Don't make any provision for the flesh. In Hebrews 12, 11, it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see... Going through a trial like Jesus did 40 days without having anything to eat, it's difficult, but you know what? On the other end of it, there's training. And fasting is a good training, by the way, because you get to die to your flesh, not do what you feel like doing, and you live for the Lord. And you can, you can gain all kinds of great victories. I don't know about you, but I, Monday, Wednesday, Friday are days I don't care for because they're my gym day. <laughs> And I just, I don't understand why I couldn't find a comfortable couch and a TV with unlimited viewing. Uh, why couldn't that be a workout? I think that's fabulous. <laughs> I'll be 900 pounds in no time. No chastening seems joyful in the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
Do not love the world, 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or the things in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And this world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Those are the three temptations that were thrown at Jesus. The lust of the flesh to satisfy his hunger. The lust of the eyes, seeing all of the kingdoms and seeing the shortcut. And the pride of life. Throw yourself down from here and God will come and catch you. You're that special. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Amen. And it's knowing the word of God that makes all the difference. James 4 verses 7 to 8 says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Do you have this nagging thing in your ear where the God where you feel like the devil is telling you you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you'll never amount to anything. Yes. It says that we should submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Would, would you like to be left alone? Yes. That's the key. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's really our problem, isn't it? Because we are of earth and we are also of heaven. We were created by God as he blew his breath into dirt. And so we're dirt and spirit. We are both. <laughs> it is said, I believe it was Spurgeon who said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. <laughs> Temptation is going to come. It comes to every one of us. But what we do with it is what matters. I don't know about you, but I have thoughts that fly through my head, and sometimes I'm, I'm like at the temple in the highest place. And I'll have a thought that runs through my mind that makes me ill. Yep. Yes. I, I shoot it and I put it down and I say, no, <laughs> that's not who I am. That's not what Jesus called me to be. And I will never be that guy ever again. Amen. That's what we need to do. You will not be able to stop temptation, but you can let the devil go away right. by resisting him and by drawing near to God, and God will draw near to you. And that's a promise from the word, because it's written. Amen.